Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final week of the show. That's a show with capital S, uh, capital W, probably include even uh, capital H. So um, I decided that I'm just going to give an overview of Gala theory, which is more or less um, chapter 23 in the book. Um, and it takes, this takes more than a week to cover. It was a long shot uh, ever since we started the course anyway, but it's a very interesting subject. So I thought I would talk a little bit about it, even, even if I, I don't actually make any proofs. Um, so what's Gala theory about? Gala theory, um, it means you study automorphisms of fields, um, often about uh, often automorphisms of algebraic extensions, and understanding these, um, we understand a lot about the fields themselves. So, uh, what am I talking about? So today I'm going to talk about what automorphisms are and what we're what we're doing. So, an automorphism is just an isomorphism of a thing into itself. Into itself. Let F be a field, uh, and. Automorphism, by definition, is an automorphism of F, I guess, is an isomorphism from F to itself. Um, so a field isomorphism or a ring isomorphism. Um, for example, Conjugation, when you take a complex number and you conjugate, um, you get an automorphism. Um, maybe, maybe I'll call it sigma. So sigma of a complex number by definition is the conjugate. So if I write it as a plus bi, it's a minus bi. Um, if a and b are real numbers. So uh, let me let me prove it. So first of all, it has an inverse because the inverse of conjugation is conjugation um, because if you conjugate a complex number twice, you get itself. So can two numbers have the same conjugate? Uh, no, unless they're the same because you would conjugate and get the and get the original number back. Does, is every complex number the conjugate of something? Yes, it's the conjugate of its conjugate. All right, so it's bijective. Um, when you conjugate, let me, so I want to write sigma. When you add adding and conjugating is the same as uh, conjugating then then adding. I'm not gonna check this. This is kind of boring to check, and there's no mystery. And Multiplying and conjugating is also the same as conjugating then multiplying. Um, and this one I should check, right? It's, it's less boring. Um, so if you if you multiply 
And then conjugate, what you're supposed to do is uh, multiply AC minus BD plus I AD plus BC, and then conjugate this whole thing, which just means AC minus BD, keep the real part the same, flip the sign of the um, of the complex parts, the imaginary parts. So that's one side. Uh, on the other side, A minus BI times C minus DI is ready, AC minus BD. So BD is multiplied with two minus signs, which cancel and two i's, which give me a minus sign. And then i has negative bc minus ad, and these are the same. All right. So that's an example of an automorphism. It's a ring isomorphism, and we know very well that a ring isomorphism is the same, is the same as a field isomorphism. Knowing that it preserves multiplication already uh, tells you that it preserves division, just like knowing that it preserves addition tells you that it preserves subtraction. I guess the, the conjugate of one is one, the conjugate of zero is zero. <clears throat> All right, so that's an automorphism of uh, the complex numbers. Uh, oh my God. Um, so, the set of all automorphisms is, uh, I'm just going to write it on. That's how we usually write it. So I would say that conjugation is an element of the automorphisms of the complex numbers. Um, and the thing is that the automorphism of, of F form a group um, where the operation is composition. So you do one automorphism and then you do another. For example, you conjugate and then you conjugate again. That's what I'm calling multiplication of automorphisms. So um, I'm not going to do any proofs in this chapter or very few, I'm just going to do examples. But uh, the proof of this uh, goes in the same way for, for a lot of different, there's a lot of different proofs that go the same. Whenever you have any sort of mathematical structure and you talk about its set of automorphisms, so whatever bijections preserve the structure, you know, bijective continuous maps or something, whose inverse is continuous, of course, um, or group automorphisms or ring automorphisms, they always form a group. And the, the proof is always the same. The proof is just uh, composition of functions is associative. The identity always preserves everything and bijections always have an inverse. So that's the proof. All right, so um, for example, the automorphisms of the complex numbers is, um, is a group um, that I know very little about. I know it's very big. Um, <clears throat> but for example, I know that it contains um, it contains the identity. So one is the identity, and it contains uh, conjugation. And since conjugation, uh, when I do it twice, I get the identity, it would tell me that this is a subgroup because it's close under, under composition, which is multiplication. 
So I guess one thing I know about this group is that it contains the subgroup of four there too. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's, like, it's a very mysterious object, um, not just to me. Okay. Uh, let me give you another example of automorphism. <clears throat> Take any finite field. Then um, this, which, what do I call it? What do people call this? I don't know. Doesn't have a name. No, we should do it. should have a name. Row, row, which takes everything and takes the pth power of it, is an automorphism. Um, it's called Frobenius after um, someone named Frobenius that I know nothing about, uh, and who probably didn't discover this because that's how things normally get named. Um, so uh, why why does this work? So this is a magical thing about p being zero that I talked about last week. Um, zero to p is zero, one to the p is one. Um, if I add two things and I and I take the pth power, I get the sum of the pth powers because uh, this is the the freshman stream. Ugh. that I proved for you last week. You take the binomial expansion, which has a bunch of terms, and all the ones that are not a to the p and b to the p are multiples of p, so they are just uh, zero. And not less important is the fact that you take two p powers and you take the uh, you take two two p powers, you multiply, and that's the same as multiplying and then taking the p power. And that is the magic of the commutative property of multiplication. So, um, rho is a homomorphism. So I guess, how do I know it's an automorphism? <sighs> Why is Provenius bijective? Well, um, it is injective. In other words, the kernel is zero because if something is in the kernel, that's saying that its piece power is, sorry, <clears throat> that's saying that when I do row to it, I get zero, but row is just a piece power. Uh, so how can the piece power of something be zero? Um, it has to be zero itself. So the Frobenius homomorphism is injective, um, and therefore it must be surjective because uh, the field is finite. And if you have a map from a set to itself, uh, from a finite set to itself, and it's injective, it must be surjective as well. Um, because uh, if it's if it's injective, you know, there's p to the n things and it's injective, the image must have at least p to the n things. And that's everything. This is very special about being finite, right? If you if you take <clears throat> if you take an infinite set, you could have injective maps. Like you take natural numbers, you add a one, and that's an injective map, but it's not surjective. Um, but that doesn't happen for finite sets. So 
rho is an automorphism of a finite field. And let me, so this was sort of abstract, but I can show you, look at F4. F4 is, is a field with four elements, and we've already seen that it's, uh, it's generated over F2 by, um, a degree, so by, by a degree two elements whose minimal polynomial is the only degree two irreducible polynomial over F2. And he has a multiplication table. Uh, well, I'm writing, I have, he has a multiplication and an addition table that I can just um, figure out from, from the, this equation. Um, how does it go? Well, you add zero to anything, you get it itself. Um, you add one, you add anything to itself, you get zero because one plus one is zero. You add one plus omega, you get negative omega squared. Um, the table is symmetric. That's the relation we have. And omega plus omega squared is one. And multiplication goes like this. The thing is, this equation implies that omega cubed is one. So there's ones here, omega times omega is omega squared. One times anything is itself. And omega to the fourth is omega because omega cubed is one. So if I now do the Frobenius, which means replace zero by it's squared, which is itself, replace um, one by a squared, by, which is itself, and interchange omega with it's squared, um, you're going to get the same table. Oh my god. Um squared zero zero one one. So you see that the two addition tables uh they look the same up to relabeling. <clears throat> and here I have the same the same thing. Where labeling does nothing. Omega squared, omega. All right, so um, you can try this at home. Try, try with a field with nine elements. Okay, um, so that's an automorphism. <clears throat> and those were some examples. Um, if you ask now, you could take, you know, to the Frobenius twice. That might or might not be the identity, depending on the field you look at. So let me tell you what the object of study of Galois theory is, other than fields, which is the Galois group. Uh, let me define the, the Galois group. Let F uh, take an extension. The Galois group of, of the extension is a group of automorphism. Um, it's a group of automorphisms. Uh, and we write it like this, the gal of E over F, or sometimes, I feel like in math, it's always called gal. Uh, the book calls it G of E over F, which is probably, probably with software, a lot of like the algebra software programs use. Um, it's the set of automorphisms of the set of automorphisms of the larger field such that they fix everything in the smaller field. 
So that's what the Gala group is. Um, so you take all the automorphisms and out of out of those, you look, you look at just the one, ones that uh, that have this property that everything in the smaller field is fixed. So of course it depends on E and F. Um, that's an example. The Galois group of the complex numbers over the real numbers. So this is the set of automorphisms of the complex numbers that fix every real number. <clears throat> so let me, let me show you something. The Galois group of C over R is made of the identity and complex conjugation. Um, let's prove this. One, so they're both definitely automorphisms of C that I've showed today. And the identity clearly fixes the, the real numbers. And conjugation also fixes the real numbers. So that is the, the condition that means that it's an element of the Galois group of the extension. If you if you move the complex numbers around in general, but you leave the, the real numbers, you leave them in their place. So um, this group, this group is, is contained in the Galois group that I'm looking for. And now I, I'm supposed to show the other containment that anything in the Galois group is um, <clears throat> is one of these two. So take an element in the Galois group of C over R. Then, uh, well, it leaves the, I know, so by definition, it leaves the real numbers alone. Um, it doesn't do anything to them. So the question is, what does it do um, to the complex numbers. So what does it do? Oh, I'm going to close the page. I have an element in the Galois group. What does it do to the complex number, which looks like R plus A plus BI? Well, um, because it's an automorphism. It's a homomorphism of field. So it, it commutes with addition and multiplication. So is A plus BI, it's the same as doing tau to A, B, and I, and then doing uh, all the operations. But also, um, now I notice that I have tau applied to two real numbers. So um, tau doesn't do anything to real numbers by definition of being in the Galois group. So really, I only need to know tau of i. So once I know what tau does to the number i, I know what it does to the whole extension. So um, what could tau of i be? Could it be any complex number? And uh, the answer is no. Let me tell you why. Because I know that i squared plus one is zero. If I apply tau, what I'm gonna get, well, is that tau of i squared plus one is tau of zero. So um, again, since tau is an automorphism, it's going to do doing all these additions and multiplications are going to be are going to commute with tau. So I can just do them after I apply tau, 
And since zero and one are real numbers, when I do tau, they stay in their place. So what I have is that this mysterious number that I know nothing about, tau of phi, is the square root of negative one. So what is the square root of negative one? Uh, what could it be? Well, it's plus or minus high. <clears throat> so there's two options for tau of i, which means that there's two options for tau. If tau of i is i, then for every a plus b i, I just get a plus b i, tau is the identity. If tau of i is negative i, for every a plus b i, I get a minus b i from this formula. You just replace i by tau of i and you leave a and b alone. And this is the, the conjugate of a plus b i. So tau is conjugation. So, so that's it. Um, the Galois group of c over r is a group with two elements which is the cyclic group of other two. So there you go, There now you know a Gala group. Um, using just the same proof for, um, I'm, I'm not gonna do it, but I'm gonna show you. If you add to, square, to Q a square root, you're gonna have, again, a group, the same group. Um, it has two elements, it has the identity, and an element that sends the square root of two to the negative the square root of two. So this is an automorphism that moves around the real numbers. Um, but it, um, it, it it sends root of two to the other root of two. And well, um, really, all Galois groups are you get by looking at roots of a polynomial and switching them around. Um, maybe I'll do one last example or two two more examples. I guess I'm only doing degree two examples. The Galois group of f four over f two is uh, the identity and for Venus. So the piece power, the one uh, whose table I drew a couple of slides ago. This is easy to check because there's only four things to move around. But again, you you ask yourself where does omega go? You realize it could be you could go to omega or to omega squared. Um, the other group of a finite field over FP is made. It is a cyclic group. It's made of the powers of Frobenius. I'm not, I'm not proving this, but just so I give you another example. And if you take any field, so Any, any extension as agreed to. Alpha is a root of x squared plus bx plus c, maybe a. Um, and I assume that this is irreducible. So you take sort of a generic random degree two extension, you also get a group of order two where tau since negative b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a, it sends it to the other root of the polynomial. So the Galois group has something to do with the fact that when you solve a degree two equation, in, in the degree two case, it has to do with the fact that when you solve a degree two equation, there's two options here. And and you somehow, uh, they're somehow interchangeable. And 
the fact that they're interchangeable is encoded exactly in the Galois group. All right, uh, Wesley, I'll talk some more about what Galois groups are for. Have a good rest of your week.